Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon to those of you in the West or uh, in Ireland, I should say, or evening. And, and good morning to our friends on the West Coast. I'm Danny O'Connell, National President for the Ancient Order Hibernians. And today is our first Irish American Heritage Month uh, webinar. And uh, along with me is our three of our national officers, Jerry Cole, our secretary, Sean Pender, our vice president, Leah McNabb, our treasurer. Also joining us are Neil Cosgrove, our Irish American Heritage Month chairman, Dan Taylor, our AOH historian. And two of the most important people with us are our IT folks, our um, chairman for all our um, online uh, digital access is Chris Cook, the state president for uh, North Carolina. And with Chris is Tim Noonan, and the two of them will keep me straight throughout the event. Our guest speaker today is Ruin O'Donnell, uh, who is from the University of Limerick. And to in introduce Ruin and move us forward is our National History Chairman, Dan Taylor. Thank you, Danny. Uh, the, I'd like to lay a little bit of a foundation, if you will, for Ruin's remarks today. And I'll start way back uh, some 800 years ago. Um, the dogged resistance of the Irish people to foreign rule is undoubtedly one of the longest running stories in history. Over the course of some eight centuries, the Irish repeatedly rose to assert in arms their right to self-determination. And on more than one of these occasions, there was some hope of assistance from a foreign ally. During the Nine Years' War, for example, there was an alliance with Philip III and Catholic Spain but defeat at Kinsale in 1602 marked the end of the old Gaelic order. The First Republic of Revolutionary France sought to aid the United Irishmen in 1796 and again in 1798 with no better result. And over the course of some three centuries, the Irish people had been subjected to a series of harsh penal laws designed to do nothing less than to eradicate Gaelic Catholic Ireland. These laws were such that the Enlightenment philosopher Edmund Burke referred to them collectively as a machine of wise and elaborate contrivance as well fitted for the oppression, impoverishment, and degradation of a people and the debasement in them of human nature itself as ever proceeded from the perverted ingenuity of man. And yet the dawning of the 19th century found the Irish people stubbornly clinging to their national and cultural identity. The year 1845 found an Irish population of some 8 million souls, with the rural populations reduced to tenant farming on the land of their ancestors, largely dependent upon a single crop for their subsistence. The blight that struck the potato crop in 1845 persisted for seven long years, during which the British government's laissez-faire policy yielded on Gore Moor, the Great Hunger, a catastrophe, the horror of which seared itself into the collective psyche of the survivors and their descendants for generations to come. Out of the unthinkable crime that was the great hunger, there arose, somewhat ironically, a new and powerful ally in the quest for Irish self-determination, Irish America. As a million of their countrymen died of starvation, nearly two million Irish emigrated to North America. And those who survived the aptly named coffin ships brought very little with them in material terms. But in their hearts, they carried the collective grievances of their people, historic wounds rubbed raw by the stunning indifference of the British government to the suffering of the Irish people. It took the British government 150 years to acknowledge in the person of Tony Blair that the fact that one million people should have died in what was then part of the richest most powerful nation in the world is something that still causes great pain as we reflect upon it today. It did not, however, take the Irish 150 years to reach such a conclusion. In the minds of those Irish forced to flee their homeland, there was no doubt that no government across the Irish Sea that had allowed grain ships to depart from Irish ports while Irish women and children lay dying by the roadsides could ever claim legitimacy. Once here in America, Irish immigrants faced daunting challenges of their own. Nativist opposition, the know-nothings, 
crowded tenements and stark poverty. Yet as they worked their way up and into the fabric of American society, the burgeoning Irish community held fast to their belief that Ireland must take her place among the free nations of the world. And one thing became readily apparent here in the United States. The Irish had a knack for organizing and a particular skill for electoral politics. And so while they built Catholic churches and schools, fought a civil war and formed the backbone of the labor movement here in the United States, the Irish formed and joined organizations, Irish organizations. Our own AOH founded in 1836, flourished and grew. In 1858, the Fenian Brotherhood was formed here the American counterpart, the Irish Republican Brotherhood founded in Ireland. And as the movement for self-rule grew back in Ireland, Irish America became an incubator of ideas, a source of funding, and at times a place of refuge for men on the run. At that same time, Irish America became a force in domestic politics, which by extension brought the power and prestige of the United States to bear on the British government as the Irish question was concerned. Such were the contributions of Irish America that when Pierce stepped out in front of the GPO on that Easter Monday in 1916 to read the proclamation of the Irish Republic, the small crowd that gathered there heard him expressly acknowledge Irish America as he noted that Ireland in striking for her freedom was supported by her exiled children in America. And during Easter week and later in British internment camps, the forces of the Irish Republic would sing a song written by Pedar Kearney that would later become the Irish national anthem, or on the Vian, a soldier's song. And in the chorus, Irish America was again acknowledged. Soldiers are we whose lives are pledged to Ireland. Some have come from a land beyond the wave. Here in America, the land beyond the wave, we would normally be preparing for parades and other celebrations of St. Patrick's Day, wonderful traditions, in which Americans of Irish descent celebrate their heritage. This year, events dictate uh, that we may not be parading, uh, but we are marking Irish Heritage Month with this series of webinars, which we hope will educate and inform our viewers so that when the parades resume next year, God willing, we might all have an enriched understanding of the heritage of which we are so proud. We are fortunate today to have with us a preeminent authority on such matters, who will be discussing the role of Irish America in 1916 and the important years thereafter, Professor Ruin O'Donnell. Dr. O'Donnell is a senior lecturer in history at the University of Limerick, author of numerous books on the history of the Irish Republican movement worldwide, including Special Category, the IRA and English Prisons, and Patrick Pierce. Uh, Professor O'Donnell has a BA and MA uh, from University College Dublin and a PhD from the Australian National University. He served as the visiting chair of Irish studies at Notre Dame in 2010 to 2011, and was a Fulbright scholar in residence at the University of Montana in 2017. Dr. O'Donnell is a director of the Irish Manuscripts Commission and a member of the university's Ireland Decade of Commemorations Committee. He is involved in academic publishing uh, as a commissioning editor of the 1916 Lives Project for O'Brien Press, as well as the series editor for the Irish Abroad series, Academic <clears throat> Press. And with that, Professor O'Donnell, I, the floor is yours, or perhaps I should say the screen is yours. Thanks for that introduction, uh, Daniel. Um, I've been asked to speak in this um, important occasion about the role Irish America played in the revolutionary period of 1916 up through the sadly into the Civil War, 19, up to 1923. And it goes without saying that I can only do the bare bone outlines of the major events, the major political occurrences to contextualize those, mention some of the major personalities who are involved, but this won't be an in-depth lecture and many of you are undoubtedly relieved to hear that. Um, the background is very brief described as such. In 1910, the general election in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, we were joined then since the Act of Union in 1801, and it led to a surprising result. A liberal government got in, that was favorable towards Irish self-determination within the British Empire. In other words, they were open to the idea that Dublin would resume its role of having a subordinate colonial assembly called a parliament in Dublin, um, but within the British Empire, which certainly would have been a great advance on what had happened during the years of crisis in 1840s, 1850s, which was absolutely very much the fault of Westminster. 
Now, by um, April 1912, because of various reforms that had been pressed by John Redmond and the Irish Parliamentary Party, moderate nationalists, who say we were happy enough at home rule, as it was called, it became clear that there would be uh, a devolved assembly in Dublin by the fall of, um, of 1914. Now, this is where fate dealt us one of its many bitter blows. You sort of get used to that living in Ireland, which is, of course, that the Great War broke out and Britain declared war on Germany and made good on that by moving troops, this professional standing army to fight in France, uh, an army that included tens and only hundreds of thousands of, of Irish uh, full-time professional soldiers and native volunteers. But the threat of home rule, as was seen by those who were opposed to this, namely British Empire loyalists who were afraid that if Ireland was allowed to go its own way, they could lose their grip on various vulnerable assets of their colonial empire, which was vast and then global. And it was, it was a point of view that was rational. The only problem was it was anti-democratic. And they began to conspire with fascistic, proto-fascistic elements within Irish society that were quite happy to go along with a records charter of preventing Irish self-determination. Now, British engagement in a world war was something that Clan, Clan de Gael in America, the successor to the original Fianna Brotherhood, in consultation and, and direct cooperation with his Irish annex, the Irish Republican Brotherhood headquartered in Dublin, had been looking forward to, in some ways, as a strategic opportunity. The thinking was that if the British military were permanently or heavily engaged in an international war, as opposed to, as they used to call it, teaching lessons to natives, in other words, savaging those in, in developing countries, uh, they would be find it more difficult to hold on to an Irish Ireland if it was in a state of insurrection. So that was very much the thinking of Irish Americans in the 1910s, particularly those clustered around John Devoy in New York, John McGarrity in, in, in Philadelphia, and various other personalities from coast to coast and including parts of the South. So the First World War was an opportunity, but they also realized that the Irish rebels would have to act before America got drawn into an international uh, conflict, because then it would not be possible to provide the type of transatlantic political and uh, war material aid that could be happen, that could happen if America was not engaged. They, they witnessed the experience of 1898 during the Spanish-American War, where a great opportunity, as we've seen in, in hindsight, was lost, particularly as the British were engaged in the Boer War, which went quite badly for them until they uh, sued for terms of peace with the Boers. Now, Tom Clark, a key figure in this, had been sent home from New York to Dublin, which he, which he had very little connection with prior to 1907, to act as the emissary of John Devoy in New York and basically to represent the Clan Gale interests in the highest echelons of the IRB, which he became the treasurer. So once that happens, behind the scenes, there's preparations for something like uh, manifested itself as the 1916 Rising. Uh, that could have been 1915, it could have been 1918, it happened to be the 24th of April 1916, when various forces coalesced eventually. In 1913, 1914, with the, the crisis of the Great War and, and the threat to Irish aspirations of at least home rule, which most modern nationals could get their head around, uh, the IRB decided that they needed a front, broader, mass based organisation, and that was Ogle Heron, aka the Irish Volunteers, better known from 1916 as the Irish Republican Army. Now, this is very much the creature of the secret leadership of the IRB and their allies in America in Clan Gael. It became a large organization, uh, formally publicly founded on the 25th of November 1914, 1913 rather, but in actuality uh, had been projected for some time before that. And um, many people will be aware that uh, organizations and militias known as the Irish Volunteers were already in existence in New York, in, in Northern California, in Western Montana and other centers of strength of Irish American activity due to the Klan utilizing McKinley's reforms and militias to put Irish and Irish Americans under arms in preparation for something like assisting an Irish revolution. Uh, one of the first significant political organizing uh, acts committed by Patrick Pierce, the great Irish patriot, was to come to America in as, as early as February 1914 as director of organization of the Irish Volunteers, Owen Heron. Uh, Publicly, this was sort of talked up in terms of raising money for his pioneering school, St. Dennis for Farnham, and that was indeed part of the agenda. But the real agenda was to raise money for what was called the Equipment Fund. And if you read back on the, on the, um, the voluminous uh, editions of the Gaelic American, which are fortunately are extant, edited by John Devoy, you will see that the conscriptions to the Equipment Fund begin to burgeon from uh, the early months of 1914. Pierce did a very successful speaking tour, and uh, some of the more prestigious events were the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which was uh, you know, beyond capacity with the New York state governor was present. It was a huge affair. And also the Aeolian Hall in Midtown Manhattan. And then he, he embarked on an extended tour that took in Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and, and many places within reach of his base in Manhattan. 
He was joined by a quite important man, Bomer Hobson, who was significant in setting the scene for Pierce's tour in America, but there was other people also uh, moving around, not least Thomas Ashe, fated to die in hunger strike in 1917, and Dermot Lynch. Now, Dermot Lynch is a person who features across the revolutionary period on both sides of the Atlantic. Now, without spoiling the story, he was the single most important IRB member not to be shot dead by the British in May 1916. On the 26th of July 1914, um, a loan of money that was received by Roger Casement in London, but backed by John Devoy in New York, succeeded in running a consignment of guns into Hove on the outskirts of the suburbs, a coastal suburb of Dublin City, followed a week later by another consignment run into Cuckoo County Wicklow, where it was received along, amongst others, Eamon de Valera, uh, Liam Mellows, and all the who's who of the revolutionary period were involved in this first hand. That proved to the Irish support base that the people they were dealing with were not only serious, but capable that on the cusp of a global war, they could move weaponry from the continent into Ireland. Uh, well, on that basis, you can see the huge public accretion of funding towards the illegal activities in Ireland and, and a greater buildup of the political power base. Now, what, of course, was, was very significant was that by the 4th of March 1916, Britain was not doing well in the First World War, neither was France, much to its detriment, but America had not yet entered the war. So it's still possible to have a great degree of public organization of events in the United States of America and indeed other centers, but it's the US ones that were preeminent by far. But on the 4th of March, 1916, the Friends of Irish Freedom, a title that is not particularly well known these days, was brought into, into being at a convention of what was known as the Irish Race Convention. Now the first series of Irish Race Conventions had also been run with Fenian connections to back up the land war, to back up Parnell, at his deal that he had been negotiated or encouraged to accept from Don Devoy to be a, take a muscular approach to improving the land system and therefore the political system in Ireland in the 1880s. Uh, different expressions of that would, would mutate into, into assassinations and various Irish American bombing missions. It's a little bit complicated and disparate, but suffice to say, this is a new series of meetings of the Irish Race Convention. And it, of course, was a projection of the Clan de Gael, who completely dominated the executive. Uh, some of them were publicly known figures, such as uh, Judge Daniel Cohallan, who was the grandson of a Cork, a Gortomore emigrant, and the son of an IRB and a Clan de Gael fighter, Timothy Cohallan, with Cork antecedents. He was a founding director member of the Gaelic American newspaper in 1903, which Devoy edited. So it's a very intimate nexus of power players who have high public profiles, but are doing a lot more behind the scenes than met the eye, at least uh, in terms of what the NYPD wanted to see or the Federal Bureau wanted to see. And certainly the British were looking, but couldn't really find the sinews. It was too much beyond their reach. Now, Cohalan, by the way, was on New York Supreme Court from 1911. So he's a very prominent figure to have advanced Republican feelings. And again, a bit like the volunteers, the, the, the revolutionary, revolutionary, sorry, the revolutionaries are hiding behind a bigger frontage of people who had more modest objectives, as well as those who sympathized with, no, we don't want just home rule. We want an independent Irish Republic to completely determine our own affairs, free of the British Empire interference, because we can never trust them. So it was highly successful. And people, people are often surprised to hear that by 1920, there were 100,000 full members of the Friends of Irish Freedom, coast to coast, with an additional 175,000 associate members. It was, it was one of the biggest ever Irish organizations in any country at any time in the world. So it was quite a big deal. And the reason why I'm stressing this before I move on is quite simply this. Many people when think of what happened during the War for Independence here, look at the American I mentioned, and they think in terms of the vast funding that came across the Atlantic. I'll, I'll address that later on. But this is why that could happen. The network was there before the 1916 Rising. And when the rising happened on the 20, 24th of May, sorry, 24th of April, 1916, the focus very quickly shifted in modern Irish America towards backing up home rule to seeking the Republic, which is a much more radical objective because the sinews of organization, the logistics and, and the, the personnel had been pre-prepared from March, 1916. Now, as I mentioned, the Irish Parliamentary Party had done some good heavy lifting in the 1910s, but by, the time the First World War had bitten into these societies on this side of the Atlantic, Redmond had lost a lot of support, not just amongst the Irish support base, but also amongst the, the in, in North America and Canada, where the United Irish League and those countries, also in Australasia, had been quite significant raising funds for them. But they were disappointed in August, 19, in August, September 1914, when he committed the Irish volunteers, which of course was secretly run by the IRB, to the war effort which was completely antithetical to, to anyone who wanted a republic to come into being, 
as opposed to a creature vassal state of the empire as had existed since then um, prior to 1801. So the fall off in support for the modern position is important and the willingness of ordinary Irish Americans to contribute towards something that was more radical became more natural. Uh, the rising of course was the powder keg situation. It did not succeed in the sense that the, the, the six days that was public did not lead to full Irish independence, but the promulgation of the text of, the, of, the, of, the, of its agenda, uh, as read by Patrick Pierce, as Daniel mentioned earlier, at, the, at the, the frontage of the GPO, was very powerful. And diplomatic forces that were international um, looked at one point to favor Irish interests in that when America entered the war with the, with the principles of the 14 points, which had heavy Irish-American input to the Democratic Party and indeed others, it looked like small nations such as ours would be favored in some form of post-international conflict uh, negotiations. And Pierce, had, Pierce was fully cognizant of this uh, in the GPO prior to the relocation to the Moore Street headquarters and then the final surrender, which resulted in his execution. Uh, if you were people like the Voy, McGarity, Cohalan, who visited Pierce in Ireland in the prior to the rebellion, these were friends of theirs. They weren't just comrades and ideological allies, they were their personal friends. And to have them executed in camera, in other words, in secret, and words of their faith dripping out days later was emotions, but they were certainly impacted and rededicated to the political processes that they had jointly conceived with those men. In America, there was uproar when news of the rising came through, despite the fact that it was subject to heavy wartime censorship by the British, which was often circumvented by using uh, tele telegram tra um, traffic by various ingenious messages to send uh, more unexpurgated accounts of what was happening to people like McGarry, people like Don Devoy, who then were able to send the message out. Let's just say that uh, Clark was an American citizen. Dermot Lynch was down the roster, census to death, commuted. Uh, in the meantime, they'd met Plunkett on secret business in New York and indeed DC. Uh, many of the people they dealt with were now dead, but the mission had been as such politically validated in Ireland. And with the Irish reascent towards the position of the declared Republic, very quickly, the Friends of Irish Freedom got behind that. Now they were looking towards things like the post-war resolutions, but in the meanwhile, you have an important event. On the 18th and 19th of May, 1918, it's not terribly glamorous, but there was the second in the revived series of the Irish race conventions, again, this time in Upper Manhattan. Now they prudently, because the America joined the war in, 18, in 1917, April 1917, they prudently backed the American war effort. Hitherto, they had uh, advised an, uh, an isolation, traditional isolationist position, but that had been overturned by domestic politics in, in, the, in the capital, and they went with that. It would have been foolish to do anything else. Of course, it was extremely important that the Irish community and indeed the German community were not seen to be in any way treasonous or seditious or undermining the American war effort. And, and of course they were not. And famously units like the, the 69th Irish Regiment uh, as the 165th Regiment were, were won yet more battle honors in that important campaign, particularly uh, running into 1918. So the position was that they had to be cautious. Now, some of the survivors in 1916, including Liam Mellows, who was on um, Fenian business in the United States of America, mainly gun running and also a little bit of background work of political organization. They were hoping for something a little bit more firm, something a little bit more um, assertive in terms, no, we want the Republic, but they had to respect that the American Irish were going to play it the way they had to do within their own polity. And that was respected ultimately. Now there were some outliers uh, and you'll often see the, the fringe elements and I don't mean to, to deprecate them because they're both extremely important to people but it is a fact to say that Jim Larkin by 1917, 1918 was a fringe element. He was an open supporter of the Bolshevik revolution in, in Russia, uh, which was a hard sell in the United States of America then. And now uh, similarly, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington. So when they were harping on against organizations such as the AOH for being too moderate and too conservative, when they were being critical of the, the, um, the Irish Americans who were representing the leadership of Friends of Irish Freedom, they were doing so from very selfish, narrow political positions which did not chime with the broad Irish support or indeed the Irish American reality. I mean, I could give you examples, but in the audience, you had Dermot Lynch, uh, survived partly due to sessions of the Roseville family and others. You have Pat McCartan, who had been one of the key figures in the clan of Philadelphia, with McGarity, prior to going back and taking part as much as he could in 1916, rising as native Tyrone. You had Peter Golden, less known figure, John Devoy, they're all there at this convention, but they've been relatively quiet. A couple of new personalities, I'm just gonna pencil their names in there because many of you will not have heard them before. 
the man who emerged as the most significant voice, newer voice of the respectable American Irish was John Forrest Kelly. Uh, he was the son of a Tipperary Fenian of the 1867 uh, outrising. He'd moved to the United States as a boy. He worked as assistant directly with Thomas Edison in Menlo Park. And he was personally very prominent in the development of General Electric, hence his, uh, his new residence in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where I used to live for a while. Uh, he was president of the Massachusetts Friends of Irish Freedom and, a, and a, a, an absolute gold standard, respectable Irish American. He became the type of person you wanted during wartime to represent your nationalist position. Also there, an important figure, Judge John J. Goff, uh, again, New York Supreme Court member uh, and a personal associate of Woodrow Wilson. Now, Wilson gets a bit of a bad press, but Wilson in his private correspondence was much more sympathetic towards Ireland than he was in some of his political roles in office, which again are partly due with tensions within the Democratic Party, which is losing ground constantly to the Republican Party at that period in time, and they're on the cusp of losing control of the Senate, which in terms of foreign relations is obviously an extremely important strategic asset. So these are not stupid, they're doing the best they can, but, but a lot of it's happening behind scenes, behind closed doors. Goff goes all the way back to the eight, April 1876 uh, rescue of the Fenian prisoners from, from uh, Fremantle, the Catalpa rescue, uh, which uh, Du Bois was extremely prominent, as was John Boyle O'Reilly, the great Irish Republican uh, propagandist and writer, then domiciled at that time in Boston. The triumph of Sinn Féin in the first election after the First World War changed everything, because no one could claim that the Irish people did not want a republic. Sinn Féin campaigned in December 1918 well, on the basis of an expanded electorate under UK rules for a separate independent Irish Republic and won a landslide victory. That, of course, was completely rejected by London as the wrong result, the wrong democracy at work, but it electrified the international Irish diaspora because they could see that the agenda of 1916, the secret agenda of the Fenians for, for the previous generation was within sight and could be represented as being the correct actual natural position of Irish aspirations. This of course gave hope that Ireland would have a, a separate representation at the Paris peace talks and there's two efforts to do this, which I'll discuss very, very briefly before moving on. The Third Race Convention, the first one after the war, met in Philadelphia, a major, major center of Irish strength then and now, on the 23rd of February, 1919. They elected a three-man with some supporting staff, American Commission on Irish Independence. And the, vert the role of these men was to go to Paris, representing Irish American popular opinion, and to seek to encourage the American delegation effectively to negotiate a favorable outcome as was occurring for Poland, for you go. Slavia and for, for various Czechoslovakia and various out of the crumbling empires that had collapsed during the Great War. So the, the Philadelphia Convention, again, not the most glamorous occasion, but has concrete political results. Uh, three quick personalities. One was Frank P. Walsh. Frank P. Walsh was born in a substantial Irish American community in St. Louis, Missouri, moved to another one in Kansas City where he got married and had an extensive legal career. He specialized in labor law and was part of the American government's labor board with the uh, former president, uh, William Howard Taft, during the First World War. So he's a top level Irish American. Another man was Edward Dunn, former mayor of Chicago and governor of Illinois. At that point, the only man to have held those two positions. Um, born in, in, in Waterton, uh, Connecticut, to P.W. Dunn, who'd gone into exile in 1849, arising from the involvement in the 1848 uprising of the United Irishmen. And it's people like him who founded the, the Fenian Brotherhood in New York in, in March 1858. Uh, his mother, incidentally, was the daughter of a United Irishman, so he, he had it on both sides of the family. He had no chance he was going to be an American Irish patriot. The third figure is Philadelphia, Michael J. Ryan, and he's interesting because Michael J. Ryan had been the past national president of the United Irish League, which had been the big support body for the Irish Parliamentary Party. But to have someone like him sort of cross the floor to the more advanced uh, re and the revolutionary objective of an Irish Republic from a moderate national position is important. And it's people like him who helped people, the, the, uh, the organization of the Friends of Irish Freedom, much in the way that, that thousands of individual Hibernians were deeply involved in the Friends of Irish Freedom. Uh, to give you a sense of how respectable it was, there was over 30 bishops attended that particular convention and it really had become a mainstream Irish American position as opposed to more moderate objectives of before. Now, those men found on traveling to Paris that the American delegation itself was in strife. Uh, the, uh, the elections, uh, Wilson's political career was in decline. Uh, the midterm elections hadn't gone their way in terms of important committees. Uh, the usual things that happened in domestic politics, but it was bad timing. 
And effectively, the US were doing their best to extricate themselves from the European adventure, which was indeed at that point quite unusual. It was also very unusual for a sitting president, perhaps even unique at that point, to leave the country as a sitting president to negotiate on, on behalf of DC. These days it's quite common, but not in those days. So they did not succeed, but they did get a lot of positive resolutions in Congress. They got a lot of private expressions of goodwill. And it wasn't that the Americans didn't want to help Ireland. They couldn't. The combination of domestic issues and international changing situation had, had altered the whole situation. UK, amongst other things, had become a major debtor nation of the US. They ultimately reneged on that debt and negotiated the big, huge one in 1917 and, and other substantial tranches. They reneged on it. And of course, the American delegation did not sign the Treaty of Versailles. So they reverted a position which in, had been the one sought by Irish Americans a few years earlier. Such was the complexity and the vagaries of these, these revolutionary times. Now, the uh, Sinn Féin, um, the, the, the voice of the Republican movement in Ireland, um, with the backup of the Irish Republican Army, the illegal paramilitary organization, they sent their own delegation to Paris and, and similarly met with Shrift, and in fact got possibly even less of an airing. A lot of sympathy, a lot of support from various diplomats, but no concrete action. We were lucky. Uh, Poland was lucky, uh, as uh, comparatively. Uh, Yugoslavia, certainly. Uh, Czechoslovakia, definitely. The Silesians were allowed to have a plebiscite. We weren't even allowed to have a plebiscite. Uh, what could we do within constitutional methods to advance our issue of national self-determination? And this is why, with the failure to, to advance through national um, empire and international forums, the total failure, other options became um, acceptable that in normal circumstances would never be countenanced by what was then a quite socially conservative country, Ireland. Um, the focus on eventually gaining our American diplomatic support became much more into the position. And this is why Eamon de Valera, the leading figure in the, of the political figurehead, this only surviving a battalion commandant from the 1916 Rising and an American citizen, spent most of the Irish War of Independence on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, he had to escape from jail to do so. And he did so in the company of Sean Milroy, a member of the Hibernian Rifles, uh, who had fought in 1916. Um, people forget that the AOH Irish American Alliance uh, had their own armed wing in Ireland, which headquartered in Frederick Street, which did take part in the rising, uh, headquartered of the GPO attached to headquarters there. Um, and Milroy and, and De Valera and another man with the assistance of the IRB, organized by the famous, soon to be much more famous, Michael Collins, um, masterminded their escape, and he went to America. He went uh, as a wanted man, of course, via Liverpool and arrived initially into a secret um, safe house uh, on 39th Street, Manhattan, which was occupied by Liam Mellows, another important leader on the run, who was an Irish Republican Brotherhood emissary in America. Also, pres also present, not by, by arrangement, of course, but no accent here, was the famous Joe McGarrett himself of Philadelphia and New York. So they were going to decide how are we going to use De Valera in this country when the war for independence in Ireland was hotting up it had begun on the 21st of January 1919 with the first sitting of the, of the Dáil, in other words, the members of Sinn Féin elected to the Imperial Parliament who refused to go there and sat in Dublin to represent the Irish independent government. And the IRA on the same day commenced the War for Independence, the Salthead Beg in County Tipperary, not far from where I'm sitting right now. Very quickly, very quickly, De Valera reaches out to some important power brokers. One was Cardinal James Gibbons of Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Gibbons is one of these figures who deserves a bigger, a bigger uh, say in our historiography because he was effectively the, not just the face of Irish American Catholicism, he was effectively the face of Catholicism in America. And that, and that made him a very important person. He was more significant as a sort of a popular uh, spokesperson than even members of higher clerical rank, and these those were backed by the Vatican. Uh, Senator Borough in DC, who'd been a great uh, ally of Sinn Féin um, uh, from the Republican Party, incidentally. Um, he, he was also very much on side with De Valera and headquartered out of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, which has moved sites a few times to the since on some different changes. De Valera mounted an extraordinarily successful tour. In fact, it was a double tour. He went coast to coast twice. His key ally should have been, and was for a while, uh, Judge Daniel Cohallan, who, if you recall, was the president of the Friends of Irish Freedom. Um, but Cohallan had a slightly different agenda. His basic view could be encapsulated as this. They would work for Ireland in America, which would mean that Irish American, American Irish voices should be logically, rationally, those would decide how that would be fulfilled. But de Valera had a very different role as president of a party, an unrecognized president of a country with no, with no diplomatic status. For a while he'd been commander chief also of the IRA, but he, he passed that on quite quickly to others. De Valera believed that Sinn Féin and the IRA should determine 
just to dictate the type of support they wanted in America to Americans. And ultimately, that created a fault line that got worse in late 1919 and worse again in 1920. I'll spare you the, the fine details of that. That, that is uh, several lectures, which, uh, which could be warranted, but, but not today. His core mission was to raise $5 million, which would be used to underwrite the illegal Doyle activities and those political activities of the Republican movement in Ireland. Now, a lot of money was also needed for the war effort. Now, from the 1910s, uh, quantities of American war material were coming into Ireland. American shotguns, um, automatic pistols were used in 1916 and heavily utilized during the War of Independence. The, the major supplies of the Tom, famous Thompson submachine gun, which was part of a Fenian project initially, uh, they were laid down and ultimately small quantities got in in time to be used against British forces. The 1919 variant was quite rare and highly collectible. So if you have one, hold on to it or auction it or something. But, I mean, don't, don't, uh, don't scrap it. Uh, they, he succeeded in getting five in. In fact, he succeeded in getting more than that. But I can only give you a quick outline of it. And this is, this is where history can, can almost be comical. It's believed that the inspiration for the bonds, the doll bonds, as they were called, was the Confederate government's bonds, which, of course, were not redeemed because they lost the Civil War. Now, <laughs> the Irish war bonds uh, equivalent um, were illegal. It was against American law for, to raise money for a foreign political entity on American territory. So this is the type of wrangling that de Valera had immediately with Cahalan. De Valera sought a legal solution, so they asked people who knew things about this. So McGarity uh, got his man on the job, Martin Conboy, and between the, the Irish-American heads in, in Philadelphia, New York, they figured it out. We're going to call them bond certificates, which is not illegal, but they're exactly the same thing, right? Amongst those that were famously consulted was uh, a man with, with some Irish uh, roots, which, which he was proud, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, future US president. Uh, Roosevelt had started his legal career in the firm of Marvin, um, of Marvin um, and, and Emmett, and there was another partner, which had been founded by Thomas Addis Emmett in 1805, the elder brother of Robert Emmett, and at one time the president of the United Irishmen. So the political sort of genealogy of this is fascinating, very complicated, but this is why people like these are consulted and not a and it's because they're the, the right level of knowledge, the right background, the right motivation, and they were very very effective. There'd be very few times in Irish history when such external support was ever available. I mean, you could count them on the fingers of one hand. Now, to move on, I'll just give you a flavor of this. When de Valera went to South Station in Boston, ahead of his major rally in Fenway Park, 25,000 people met him at the station. He'd already been held up in a good way in Providence, Rhode Island, and in New London and Connecticut. He was swarmed on his way to meetings. Uh, the, the only places big enough to host crowds of the, of the size were baseball parks, baseball arenas, right? Baseball grounds. And they, they received their biggest ever, to that point in time, um, compliments of people. Just as it happened, same thing had happened in 1916 with the use of Madison Square Garden and Carnegie Hall for Irish rallies in the aftermath of 1916 Rising. Uh, once de Valera is in town, it's a big, big story covered by all the major news outlets throughout. When he came back to New York C City on the 8th of July, 1919, it was the day that Wilson had his uh, victory parade, which he thoroughly deserved in terms of bringing America successfully to, a, to winning uh, the First World War and out safely as such. Um, de Valera, the following week, went to, went to Mount Square Garden when there were 12,000 inside and 10,000 outside. And he was astute enough not to criticize Wilson for being less than emphatically and supportive during the Paris peace talks, right? He knew better than to do that, but the crowd were agitated. And ultimately, ultimately the the disaffection of the Irish vote base and the Democratic Party was a major factor in his failure to be re-elected and, and his loss, of course, uh, in 1920. De Valera toured the country. And, and again, there's lectures in this, but I'll just give you one quick uh, run through. He went to San Francisco, which is a huge Irish city with a substantial tranche of Brooklyn Irish, and indeed Irish who went to the American gold rushes and across the Pacific route to, to uh, the west coast of, of Northern California. Very interesting Irish community of San Francisco. It's old. It had been replenished many times, but interesting. Amongst the sponsors there was the senator, the Democratic senator, James Duval Falam, considered a controversial figure for reasons that are not uh, uh, pertinent to this particular talk. But Falam was extremely influential with government and he was extremely wealthy. He was one of the wealthiest Californians uh, of, his, of his era. And that's saying something. That's saying something in the aftermath of the gold rushes and the development of banking and commerce out of the port of Oakland and San Francisco. Duval purchased... Uh, a statue of Robert Emmett and Dick, uh, gave it to the city so the city could have de Valera unveil it when he was there in July 1919. And that's the level of resource this man had. 
The first statue had been, had been cast during wartime in the Washington Naval Yard, during wartime, uh, to the design of Jerome Connor, an Irish Republican based in the East Coast of America for the most part, um, in bronze. It was gifted to the Sony Institute, and that's the one that's now on Massachusetts Avenue outside the, near the Irish Embassy in, in Washington, D.C. Duval said, I have one of them, and I know just the man to unveil it. So you're looking here at the top level. At Shell Mound Park, 20,000 people went to see it. And he had many of these, many of these uh, activities. Um, he went to Salt Lake City. He went to Butte, Montana, hugely Irish town, still is, albeit a bit smaller. They met by the governor, everybody meant. Now, just to give you a sense of this, they nearly, they nearly scored a huge feat in June 1920 when the behind the scenes quiet lobbying of Judge Cohallan got the situation of Ireland on the agenda of the Republican, Party, the Republican Party's convention in Chicago. And that's when the wheels began to fall off in terms of where the Friends of Irish Freedom would relate to Sinn Féin. Because without giving the full version, which is quite detailed, in a nutshell, the Republican Party could pass pro-Irish resolutions because the people like Bora and others who were totally behind them. The problem was they did not want to commit to an Irish Republic because that was going to cause diplomatic problems with the beleaguered London government who were in the process of starting to lose their entire empire and having gone bankrupt during the First World War and, and on the cusp of reneging on their American laws. So there was, a, there was a greater strategic picture that did not make sense from an American point of view for a Republican Party ahead of time to preempt negotiations. Um, the IRA at that point were being very successful and um, appeared to be invincible. And whilst they weren't driving the British from the field, they were very much holding their own and it's the most ferocious guerrilla war scene in Western Europe in after the aftermath of the First World War. There's nothing like it anywhere else. You have the first use of command wire explosives, IEDs. You've got the development of mortars. You, you have the development of uh, flying column specialist uh, full-time forces. You have a highly developed IRA intel, counterintelligence and intelligence capacity. There's things that just were not happening anywhere else on this level. And this is a first world country fighting one of the best armies in the world, which, which at, at one point had 30,000 soldiers in County Cork, let alone the country and huge numbers of uh, contractors, as well as a paramilitarized police force, so-called police force. So this is something. Now, to give you an idea of the type of pressure they were under come 1920, I'm just going to ring through very, very briefly this. 26th of September, the West, the, the Calaire, uh, sorry, the Calaire village of Kilkee was burnt by um, foreign marsh mercenaries. The same day, the market town of Trim, a very prosperous market town, was burnt by British forces as a reprise of IRA activities. Two days later, Liam Lynch, and Ernie O'Malley, O'Malley's mother was an American, the, the heiress uh, Helen Hooker, captured a British, defended British Army barracks in Mallow County, Cork, killing a sergeant, which was unfortunate, but that happens in warfare, seizing the weaponry, after which Mallow was burnt by the British Army on a rampage. This doesn't happen in Surrey. I mean, this barely happened in France during the bloody war. Um, on the 29th, one day later, two RIC men, paramilitary police, shot dead in Barrow Sully, Tipperary, two more shot dead in O'Brien's Bridge in, in Clare, Four national civilians were killed, shot dead by the British Army, firing from trucks in the Falls Road at Belfast, Western Belfast. Now, you can say things like this for the entirety of 1920. This was a major, major asymmetrical warfare experience of a, of a ferocious nature, which the British found very difficult to deal with. And this is before we get into the big massacres, such as Bloody Sunday, and the big ambushes, such as Kilmichael and Cross Barry, when the IRA were going from strength to strength and taking on the very best British soldiers and killing them. Uh, sustaining losses, certainly, but replenishing and surviving. So the pressure on the Irish-American bloc is obviously immense. And with that, the divisions on the fault lines become more uh, pronounced. I'm going to give you one or two examples before I wind this up, and then I can take questions if that's okay with Daniel. One was the interesting um, issue of one of the Friends of Irish Freedom Projects, which was the Irish Victory Fund. Now, the Irish Victory Fund was subscribed to the tune of more than $1 million in six months, to lobby politicians against DC support for the League of Nations. The thinking in America was that the League of Nations could become too much subject to the British analysis of the Irish problem in the US. And as such, America should not have anything to do with the League of Nations. We know in hindsight that ultimately America had almost nothing to do with the League of Nations, much to the annoyance of the French, which caused a different type of rift properly. Sinn Féin was ambivalent. Sinn Féin was not worried about that. Uh, they weren't worried one way or another, but the Clan de Gale and Friends of Irish Freedom were worried to the point that they advocated that the Irish Victory Fund should be wound down and any monies uh, achieved should be transferred to the, ball, to, to the Dole Bond Certificate Drive. Now, that's a very, that's a very selfish, Irish-orientated view of what should be done with that money. 
And we're not here to debate the ins and outs of that, but suffice to say, this is the type of impasse. And Cahalan was very annoyed. He was annoyed that he lost the coup of the Republican Party Convention resolution that was pending in June 1920. And now the victory fund was something Sinn Féin didn't want. And what you see is De Valera, uh, with the leadership of Irish America, becomes quite unpopular. And um, the only one who really backed him all the way because he was in very deep was Joe McGarrity. And that's important because McGarrity was an important asset to have. Increasingly, Devoy was estranged and Devoy and Cahalan were jointly estranged. Um, Liam Mellows, as a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, uh, began to fear that the Klan, because of this, were not necessarily the best allies to be involved in major gun running operations, which he was trying to pull together with Larry De Lacey and several other important players. Uh, there's a lot of emissarial secret traffic we can trace and a hell of a lot more we'll never know anything about. So these are fault lines that are significant because the IRB eventually pulled back from the Klan and start trying to control all their operations with only IRB members, not utilizing their Irish American allies. That got patched up later on, but it was quite a serious setback. Similarly, the Friends of Irish Freedom plummets in terms of support because the typical member could not understand what these wrangles were about. They weren't privy to the full details, that's often the way of these things, but nonetheless, they were voting with their feet. And the Friends of Irish Freedom, by late 1920, had lost 90% of its, of, its, of its actual membership. There was enough of a hardcore to, to keep it important in terms of the bond drives, but it was no longer a truly popular coast-to-coast -coast organization, which it was in 1919. So there are real costs of this. Um, just to move on, um, De Valera's tour, uh, the second leg of the tour, he didn't just get 5 million, they acknowledged 5.5 million. They acknowledged 5.5 million. They spent 1.4 million on internal lobbying projects, possibly to keep people like Cahalan happy enough, right? Uh, they almost certainly got more than 8 million because we know for a fact that a huge amount of the money was not accounted for. We have a lot of the money was here earmarked. British intelligence assets were obviously looking for these funds. Some of them were publicly available, but because they were pitched in ways that were fully legal to the banking system, there wasn't much of a problem. All this was basically um, secret money. Uh, as I, my last phrase here, and I'll finish up, give you a flavor of this. Amongst the cities visited by De Valera was Richmond, Virginia, Baltimore, of course, Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, he was in Philadelphia several times, in Pittsburgh, in Cleveland, in Detroit, of course, an, an Irish center that often gets overlooked, Detroit. Milwaukee, St. Paul. He went to South Bend, Indiana. He was received in Notre Dame University. Um, famously, he gets a bit of slagging for this, but it's actually quite significant. In, in Wisconsin, he took the time to go by arrangement to the Chippewa people's reservation in Spooner, made an honorary chief. There's some people in this country regard that with cynicism. It was nothing of the sort. This was actually a, 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 deep, a deeply heartfelt sort of sense of affinity with those who experienced dispossession and at times oppression. He was in Bloomington, Illinois, St. Louis, Missouri, Kansas City, of course, which still have huge Irish-American populations, Nebraska, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, very, twice in Montana that we know of, and actually I think a third occasion secretly, Washington State, Portland, Oregon, LA. Uh, there was almost nowhere he wasn't. When he was touring the South, he had with him uh, a nationalist uh, and friendly Republican Presbyterian minister, uh, Reverend Irwin, and they went all over Alabama, Mississippi. They went to all the type of places you wouldn't automatically associate with support for an Irish re re revolution and an Irish republic, but they received support everywhere. Bipartisan, non-sectarian, the focus on Ireland when it could be maintained in Ireland was phenomenally successful. And in terms of raising the doll bonds, entirely successful. Now, to conclude, the net effect of the strategic changes in Ireland the push towards what became the truce in, in, in 1920 and the ability to negotiate a, a form of peace with the British government, which was not ideal, which led to a civil war in Ireland. These are things that absolutely perplexed Irish America, which was already a little bit disconcerted that there were so many moving parts they did not comprehend. Understandably, understandably. And the IRA itself became split into three major elements. It's not just a pro-treaty, anti-treaty, it's also the neutral IRA. And indeed, there's those who backed out. So you could argue say there's four, four elements. Those who pulled out, those who wanted to fight on one side, the other side, and those who wouldn't fight the state and the IRA. Uh, how do you explain that in Bloomington? How do you explain that in Cleveland? It's very, very hard, and it just didn't come across well. 
In the absence of De Valera, Michael Collins was receiving the money as Minister for Finance of the illegal Dole government, Director of Intelligence of the IRA and Head of the IRB. He's a very busy man. It's an amazing time for any girlfriends, by the way. A very, very busy man. Uh, he became the public face, and De Valera not so much. And uh, De Valera came back, he wanted big operations, stunt type operations, like the storming of the Customs House, which he argued would get would do more ultimately than the piecemeal guerrilla uh, fights that were inflicting small amounts and, and, and leading to modest losses on a constant basis. He's thinking like a state. Folks, we're having just a little bit of trouble with the Wi-Fi in Limerick. We're going to give it a minute here. Uh, our plan is to take some questions. We do. I think we lost Ruan. We'll give him a minute to come back on. Uh, Dan, uh, we'll, we'll go back to you for a minute. And we do have our guests for next week's on, so we may uh, let them say hello. Let's just see how uh, Ruan does with getting back on. That's fine. And while we're waiting, I'll say that I'm, I'm sitting here in Pittsburgh and I can look out my window and see the historic William Penn Hotel where uh, De Valera was received when he came to Pittsburgh uh, as part of that uh, tour of the United States. And it's remarkable that he was a uh, escaped felon as far as the British were concerned. But when De Valera surfaced in the United States, the American State Department announced that he would not be interfered with as long as he didn't violate our laws and nothing would violate our treaty obligations. So that certainly initially sent a message to the British government that the United States uh, government would have to deal with internal uh, political considerations uh, in its treatment of De Valera. I see we have uh, our guests for next week on, Danny. Hi, Dan and Danny. I just wonder if we are uh, in uh, communication with you. This is Jim Fahey here. Jim, good afternoon. Dan Taylor. And I, I wonder, since we have a moment here, if you'd like to give us uh, a brief preview of what we are going to hear next week in the next iteration of this series. Yeah, I, I, I've just been uh, listening to Ruan there, and Lee was joining us on the picture as well, I think. And, and he has given you a, a most... Uh, spectacular analysis of a uh, hundred years of Irish history, the great broad sweep of history. But what we want to bring you next week is a singular story of one man who lived through all of that, who wrote uh, very powerfully and evocatively about the specific events um, that Ruan has talked about. And I've just been tracking Ruan's lecture, and Ruan, I, I see you in vision again, and I have to salute you. I, I just regard that as um, a, a, a dazzling um, lecture on the great sweep of Irish history. It's like I've, I've suddenly heard a hundred um, marvelous, marvelously encapsulated stories uh, that would make uh, an, an extraordinary book if you were to string them all together. But I think you've covered so much of Irish history in such a balanced way, in such an engaging way. But what we can bring you next week is the story of Michael McGovern, who was um, an Irish emigrant. He was a puddler, uh, which is one of these uh, arcane uh, crafts where you worked, uh, produce it, turning rather pig iron into steel iron, uh, into steel. And uh, he, he immigrated in the year uh, 1847, uh, Black 47 of the famine. So that was his starting point, just as, as Ruan's starting point was almost at the same point. And he makes his way to, to England, where he joins the IRB and has a secret life there and is a friend of Michael Davitt and is eventually, as uh, he becomes a... Uh, a centre uh, of a circle at the head of a, a unit of about 800 IRB men in um, Yorkshire, but the police start to close in on him and he's got to um, uh, escape from uh, Yorkshire very quickly 
and he describes it in a letter to John Devoy. And Joanne, you've been introducing us to John Devoy again. But this is actually a letter which um, Michael McGovern, the poet, wrote to John Devoy about 1929, in which he describes his time in the IRB, how proud he was to be in the IRB, the escapades he got up to. It's, it's a little bit thin on detail, but specific details like one of the things that really shocked him, and maybe it's something that will resonate with AOH members, uh, he was like almost every Fenian, refused uh, absolution. The priest wouldn't give his confession. But he was smuggled with the, by the IRB men uh, to the United States, like De Valera again, in the hold of the ship, secretly, no record. He ends up eventually in Pennsylvania, and then he goes on to Youngstown uh, in Ohio. And he, yep. he, writes all about, he writes all about that period, including he was there when De Valera uh, arrived in Youngstown. And on each specific occasion, you mentioned also, the, the Friends of Irish Freedom, or when the Friends of Irish Freedom set up in uh, Youngstown in 1916, he was always the bard or the official greeter of every Irish American organization that arrived in Youngstown. So he has written these very powerful and um, patriotic poems to uh, the Friends of Irish Freedom, to De Valera, again to the AOH, as, as Dan and Danny will know. And so what, what you, you can see. The, the broad sweep of what you have been outlining as, as 100 years of Irish history through the eyes of a man who lived through it, who was an unrequited Republican. Who, Thank when, you, Jim. We're going to go back to uh, Ruan, great. let him finish, and then we'll come back to you and Leo at the end. Uh, just, uh, you know, we got Ruan back. It's all yours, Ruan. Well, that's, that's great, Jim. That sounds fantastic. And this is how history works. You go for the generals in particular and then out again, the, the, the Zoom, you know what I mean? In that, in that sense. I was just going to finish up by saying that you end up with this tragedy that in April 1923, you have people who are on the same side one year earlier spying on each other in Manhattan. And there's a fascinating extant um, report of this that was furnished to the uh, un unrecognized Free State Consulate spying on those who are still connected to that leverage interest. In other words, those who are still being backed by McGarity. And a lot of the names aren't familiar to us because we just don't know much about them. I mean, I'll give you a quick example. Major Michael Kelly, Secretary of the AAAIR, that's the American Association for the Recognition of the Irish Republic. That was de Valera's very short-lived attempt to break away from the Friends of Irish Freedom and have a different level of platform, himself and Mellows. You have the guy called Hickland, who was described as chief gun runner, and that's all they know about him. Um, you have uh, you have his address though, 323 West 33rd Street, so Hell's Kitchen. So this is a guy based at Hell's Kitchen, uh, who's the chief gun runner in New York. You know, probably not the last time that happened. Uh, one Reynolds is a gunman, right? Uh, well, in, in a war you want gunmen, you know, but maybe you don't need them in Manhattan. I certainly hope you don't. Um, S. J. Hopkins. I'll finish on this guy, reputed to be connected with Hoover and Pickford, and has on many occasions supplied his guns to Mexico and other South American republics. He is a lawyer resident in Washington, D.C. Now, in one way, you have to look at the black humor of it, I mean, with these descriptors, but it does reflect a sad thing, which is the collapse of Irish cohesion in Ireland and its ramifications amongst the Irish diaspora, who would that one step further moved and therefore one step further confused, as anyone would be, by the rapid turn of events in 1922 and 1923. So thank you for listening. That was incredible, Ron. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, Rowan, thank you. You've given us a wonderful overview of a, of a fascinating period of Irish and American history. I wonder if you could uh, tell us uh, something of the recognition in Ireland of the role of Irish America. And I'm thinking, for instance, of the death of a boy and how he was returned home uh, for a funeral that attracted quite a crowd. Can you address that at all? Well, yes, that's very true. But to this day, regrettably, there's not enough known about the boy because really we've gone through several phases of political upheaval that have meant that they, these things are not looked at dispassionately and many of the important records were closed as a result of that. And even when they're open, the best elements of them have been redacted or retained by the departments, which is their prerogative on the grounds that it would not, uh, well, it was deemed not to be in the interest of the state. But if you have a situation where the interest of the state are deemed to be problematic 100 years later, I think there's a deeper malaise, which is that many Irish people are embarrassed at the revolutionary origins of the two states in this country. Um, and they're embarrassed with, with the effect that would have on uh, Anglo-Irish relations if we even went back to Angortamore and actually said what really bloody happened. 
Uh, there are very, very few political histories on Mangorta Moor. There's very, very few contextualized uh, political biographies of people like the Void. There's not enough on the Void. Now, I know there's some good books that are, and, and similarly of Ireland leaders, but not enough. And we, we can do them. We actually, some of the more recent in, to, the, to the tribute to the Irish government the last 15, 20 years is a, a lot more important information from the revolutionary era has been put, on, not only available, but in a very accessible manner to the National Library of Ireland and the military archives in, in, in Dublin. And that's a huge step forward. But the story of Irish America has not been written. I mean, I was only touching on people like Forrest. I was touching on people like Just Goff, let alone Quahallan. And none of these people have important biographies yet. It's astounding. Devoy, yes, I think Devoy, if I remember correctly, Devoy died in 1928 uh, and was repatriated. But when I was going to school, no one told me that Devoy was born just before Gorton Moor and remembers his brother who died during Gorton Moor when the family were driven in destitution from Meath, as were Pierce's grandparents, into Dublin City to find Dublin City preparing for a visit from the Famine Queen. Now, these are the type of things that in later life one might reflect on. When you're receiving your military training in the French Foreign Legion, have already been a, a recruiter for the Fenian Brotherhood. Now, these are the type of things that perhaps may, may add some seal to your ideology and, and to keep you involved to a level that you're described by those who hate you as a fanatic. Well, a fanatic is also a purist, but without them, was, 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 was Thomas Jefferson a fanatic? Was George Washington a fanatic? Well, there was those who thought that they were. And we all know this. Had things gone slightly different for them, they would have been executed by the British. And we'd revere them for different reasons to this day, because they're great men in their time. Regardless of this, the minor flaws of their characters that all great people have. You, you mentioned execution by the British and... You know, the boy uh, is not well known in this country. It's only in the last number of years that the Kildare Association managed to have a fine memorial of him erected in, in, in the, I think it's Kildare Town, if I remember correctly, which is very appropriate. Uh, there's no major statue of Patrick Pierce. We've had many opportunities to do this. Why not? Are we, are we embarrassed by Patrick Pierce? Why would we be embarrassed by Patrick Pierce or James Connolly or any other greats? We have a political problem here that has not manifested, it has not worked itself out just yet. You mentioned execution by the British and it, it brings to mind the conventional wisdom that perhaps De Valera was spared the firing squad by his American birth, but it didn't stop them from shooting Tom Clark, did it? No, you're, you're absolutely right, Daniel. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a well-intentioned um, misconception. Um, De Valera addressed this in later life quite correctly. He happened to be down the roster of people when they were court-martialed. Uh, people normally blame um, General Maxwell for the executions, but he was only executing British policy. In fact, they sent a separate man, a separate judge advocate general, a man named Bucknell, after Maxwell to make sure he didn't exceed that policy and decide what type of law would be utilised to post executions. They were going to execute about 200 people, but they're stopped from doing that. And I believe one of the reasons they're stopped from doing that, which would have got Devil Air around about round 14, round 15, was that, um, maybe a little bit later than that, was that there was already a, a scrutiny from the American consulate in Belfast, there was complaints from, the, from Paris when once they realised the true nature of what happened in, in Easter. And there were the Roosevelt family and others in prominence in Irish America were making intercessions. And that was, so, and Wilson did. And Wilson also made intercessions. And people always think that he's the guy that is down when, when he did. But there's, there's explanations for this. But he's also at times quite useful. So De Valera was not saved by his American heritage. And he was certainly not saved by being a British spy. That's utter nonsense. Danny, if he was a spy, the British have the worst value ever. Yes, we're going to go to a couple questions from our uh, friends here. Uh, folks uh, that are online on the uh, Zoom call, if you have a question, please raise your hand electronically. On the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a raise your hand. Uh, but we're first going to go to our chairman of Irish American Heritage Month, who really put uh, the list of events together and did a lot of work. Neil Cosgrove, if you'll unmute, and then we'll follow Neil with a question from Martin Galvin. Yes, Ron, it was an uh, excellent talk as always, and uh, yes. greatly enjoyed it. I was just wondering, I mean, uh, you kind of stopped the story. I was just wondering if you could just touch upon um, the problems that the British government had with the American reaction to the hunger strike of Terence McSweeney and the problems that that caused them in 22. Yes, um, that, that's a good one. Um, there'd been a sense of this before over Kevin Barry. Um, Kevin Barry's execution as an 18-year-old student in UCD who had taken part in an ambush that killed three British soldiers, by the way, um, was seen to be heavy-handed and harsh. At that point, um, the eyes of the world, not going to say the world, but the, the, the eyes of uh, many countries,
Looks like we may have lost Ruin there. Right. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the backlash to Kevin Barry's execution in 1920 set the scene, of course, to McSweeney, who, who was a hunger striker. Uh, now, Thomas Ashe had been force fed to death in 1917. So that, that caused a bit of a wound, particularly as he'd been the person who attended the Clan de Gale kind of secret conferences in Atlantic City and at other occasions. So there were people who knew him were important and were aggrieved, but didn't become a cause celeb. Not, not as much as you correctly say, Terence McSweeney, which was very much so. Now, a la O'Donovan Rossa, dying in Staten Island in June 1915, then buried in Ireland on the 1st of August 1915, with Pierce's famous oration, the Fenian tradition could see the value of repatriating remains. They've been doing this since the, some of the young Islanders, right? And the, indeed, the Republican plot in Glasnevin in Dublin is founded for that main purpose, and then, of course, took on a, a greater life uh, it, later on, uh, where O'Donovan Rossa was laid. McSweeney's, every day of McSweeney's hunger strike was watched. And think of the drama of this. This is a man who succeeded the assassinated Lord Mayor of Cork, who was also the OC of Cork No. 1 Brigade IRA, who was killed by British agents in the guise of so-called policemen. Um, in 1920, two the serving and former mayor of, of Limerick were also assassinated by a British military intelligence death squad utilizing uh, contractors. Uh, there's a horrible familiarity to some of this for those of you who are familiar with what happened in the 1970s, 1980s in Ireland, the northern, northern part of the country in particular. McSweeney succeeds McCurtain, and he too was arrested. And instead of just keeping him in jail, they deport him to a foreign jail in Brixton. He embarks this very public hunger strike, and anyone who knew him was, he's going to die. Uh, if this guy is not recognized in terms of political status, which he wasn't, he's going to die, and he did. That led to huge public outpourings in, in, the, in the United Kingdom. Many leading liberal politicians attended his, uh, his uh, preliminary funeral arrangements in Brixton, the, the South London inner suburb of Brixton. And of course, the repatriation, the agency of his wife was important. And you see, you saw this again with Donald Rossa, his, his very gifted wife, Mary, the widow, uh, was very effective in terms of, you know, I suppose, raising the temperature. Same with the McSweeney family. And later, the, the, the uh, widows, including Kathleen Clark, widow of Tom Clark, uh, they became important in the Civil War period. And after, I was refusing to be silent, refusing to say this was not a war crime, this was not an atrocity. Why did, my did his farmer comrades have him shot? Uh, why did the British let this man starve to death? He was widely revered. And these were people of substance. And the story, once it got out, uh, spoke, spoke to many who would be otherwise disinterested. All right, and if I may, just one more, because you, you fascinate me when you, because I guess I am in the, you know, I'm not a fan of Wilson camp, you know, uh, I guess I'm on that side of the equation, because, you know, uh, I think it was 1914, he was called upon to dedicate a statue of John Barry in Washington, and gave a pretty, you know, you are, you know, John Barry, I'm, I'm here, I've got to do this, but, you know, John Barry forgot he was Irish, and he became an American, and you, got, you lot should do the same. That was basically the tone of the speech. And um, I think he actually raided yeah. John DeVoy's there's, office. There's a whole tendency within the Democratic book called hyphenated Americans. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a thing. And, and the, you can see that point. I mean, you see, they had the German-American bond. There were a lot of German-Americans. They did not want ethnic groups uh, impacting on American foreign policy, let alone domestic policy. And I right. can see that point of view. But it, it, this is why people like Judge Kohana were so important, because they could do it subtly. They could get stuff done without sort of raising the wrong flag in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. I think he actually, I think uh, it wouldn't, you know, the Secret Service actually raided the boy. And I think the boy was actually looking at a charge of sedition at one, at one point from, from, from the Wilson government. That, that's not surprising at all, because there was, there was German activity in New York City during the First World War. It tends not to get spoken about it very much. You had that famous massive explosion on the pier, which damaged St. Patrick's Cathedral and wrecked the damaged Statue of Liberty. Um, people like Larkin were very unwisely uh, on a fringe level connected with the uh, Oslo provocateur from continental Europe, which was anathema to Kandigale. They did not want things like that happening. Right. Right. Uh, Danny, I think you're on mute, Danny. You're muted, Danny. Try it one more time. We'll go to Martin Galvin now. Okay, when I, first of all, I want to thank you and commend you and everybody who put on this lecture today for a great talk and congratulations all around. I, I have to tell you, the name John Devoy was mentioned. You've mentioned him, I think, more times. He's been mentioned by, um, been mentioned as the recipient of a letter from somebody else. He's been mentioned more times and given more credit in your talk today than I've gone to many, many and given many, many 
Easter commemorations, and you hardly ever hear his name or any credit. And he's somebody going back to when he came to the United States after being released as a prisoner, one of the Cuba Five, the Catalpa Rescue. He's the person who talked Tom Clark into leaving a 60-acre farm in Suffolk County, going to Ireland, being his man in Dublin. He's the person who sent uh, Donovan Rossa back. He's the person who had the Gaelic American, which was a rallying point. And do you think that he doesn't get the credit that he deserves in terms of being instrumental for the Easter Rising, number one? And number two, did that have anything to do with the fact that he uh, sided with Collins after the treaty or that he fell out with De Valera when De Valera was here in America? Well, uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Martin, and you know a great deal about it, um, as you've just uh, you know, proven. Um, Devoy was a backroom man. There was things that his widow, Kathleen, did not know about his activities. And at one point, I now know to be deliberately spoke about it. I'll give you a quick example. If you read Kathleen Clark's memoir, she, she makes it appear that their, their farming uh, agricultural produce uh, operation in Manorville, out in Suffolk County, was failing. That's not true. Um, he'd taken out naturalized American citizens. I believe the form of insurance against willy nilly persecutions to Dublin, which of course he's under enormous scrutiny uh, when Clark went back to, to Dublin. Kathleen Clark in a memoir says that the economic reasons disposed him to go. She, we now know, as I predicted, because letters came to light about three years ago, that proves she knew that wasn't true, that she knew that he was sent back to become the treasurer of the, of the Supreme uh, uh, Council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which he was immediately. And anyone who understands the history of clandestine organizations going back a couple of hundred years will immediately grasp. You don't come back even as a well-regarded man in 1907, this is Clark, and go in as a treasurer of the headquarters unit. It's ridiculous, right? That it just does not happen. Because he was the voice of Cante Gael, and he did reorganize by bringing aboard Sean McDermott, talent spotting, and then um, uh, improving Patrick Pierce by giving him that very sharp and open focus and involving him behind the scenes. Uh, this is Clark from the boy in things like the key position in the O'Donovan Rossa, um, commemoration where he famously said finished the fools the fools the fools they've left us our fiend and dead and while Ireland holds these graves Ireland on free shall never be at peace, at peace right that is exactly what the boy wanted to hear said in Dublin and it was said on film not just by Pate but also by a, a film an Irish American film crew who, who now unfortunately the stock appears to be lost that showed it venues back home and that was him for, when he spoke in Brooklyn he said that the sword of Ireland would be drawn soon. In 1915, during the war, he's saying, we're going to do it soon. And he did it in the uniform of a senior officer in Organ O'Hearn, the Irish Volunteers, the IRA. That's the boys' work. They're through Clark, and they're tight. McDermott was also, probably should have had more credit, but he'd, because he'd been jailed for sedition, he was very ill. In fact, he was in jail with Sean Milroy, who later escaped from Lincoln Prison with, with, with uh, De Valera. Um, the lines of communication are complicated, but if you look at the key figures, they're only ever one step removed. And, and they're all only one step removed from McGarity and from Devoy and, and a small number of other key people if it's more regional. Devoy is a giant. Thank you. And as you all know, Martin's uh, done a great job with uh, several webinars this year for Freedom for Ireland. We really appreciate all the work you've done. We're gonna move to Tim Noonan who is gonna bring us some questions from our YouTube. Uh, and then we're gonna give uh, those of you who are panelists one last uh, chance to say a word and Leo will close us out with uh, a little snip, snippet for uh, next week. Uh, but great work, Ron. We just can't thank you enough. And, and I guarantee you the next time I'm uh, at Limerick, uh, in Limerick, I'll buy you a pint, but we'll go to uh, Tim Noonan from Chicago. Uh, hi, Ron. Um, there was a question from a uh, a person from you uh, on the YouTube link. Uh, there were uh, there were the, uh, there were risings in several counties outside of Dublin on the day of the proclamation, but it seemed scattered and unorganized. Why was a why was a particular date of uh, for the rising across the country not solidified and organized for extensive, unified, and coordinated rising at the same time instead of a last minute scurry? I missed part of that. No. Again, you're asking the right person about this, and I could, I could talk about that for 45 minutes, but don't you worry. Um, suffice it to say, 
if the odd gar- gun shipment had been able to land at Phoenix Pier, which again heavily involved the role of Devoy in New York and DC in dealing with German and Austrian diplomats who provided this uh, pro bono, if, if that had happened and the teams waiting to distribute those weaponry throughout the country, including those who met in East Tyrone to distribute it in the northern sector hub, you would have seen substantial risings in many, many counties. Many people have never even heard of the fact that uh, South Derry um, and partly West Donegal, there were mobilizations of, of cumulatively thousands of volunteers who never engaged British forces because they were told to stop. And on Easter Sunday, with a countermanding order with McNeil, which was backed by Hobson, was already in disgrace, incidentally, for, for being too, um, I suppose, too tremulous about these things. Uh, there was confusion. In, in Tyrone, they, on one day, and Limerick, they received six or seven contradictory orders. Do rise, don't rise. Rise tomorrow, don't rise tomorrow. It is unbelievable. And the man who gave the key orders on a temporary in Limerick near me, um, the, the O'Rahilly, went back to Dublin and took part in the rising and was killed. By the way, his wife was from Philadelphia just for a little bit of American flavor. It's extraordinary. There was going to be a major rising. The, there's going to be many, many more acts of sabotage and that would have happened, except they were told not to do so by the commander in chief. And very few people in an army, whether it be regular or irregular, will go against the order of their recognized commander in chief. Simply because there's more um, actually powerful figures in play, that's not, that's not part of their order structure. So it was difficult for McDermott and Pierce and Clark to convince those to rise that, yes, we're going to do it anyway. Now, I'll finish on this. Huge misconception about the purpose of the rising. It was not to drive the British force out of Ireland. They knew they couldn't do that. The objective was to hold Dublin for 48 hours and in that time get foreign governments to recognise the declared Irish Republic. To, in other words, to preempt the need for a war of independence. But that didn't happen. And instead of that, they held out for six, which is doing really bloody well, and then over time, they garnered the type of support that they were looking for. But it's a bloody shame that Berlin, even for pure divilment, didn't recognize the Irish Republic or Rome or, or Madrid or, or DC. Anything like that would have really made put the cat amongst the pigeons in terms of the British Empire's perspective. Ruan, uh, anyone who uh, asks directions in Ireland understands that that uh, change of uh, the orders back and forth. I mean, you go down there, no, you don't go that way, you go this way. <laughs> it's just... It's still there today, that type of direction. Uh, Tim's got a handful more questions, and then we're going to go to John Hall- Hall- Callahan, and then we're going to wrap up. Actually, kind of in the same vein, um, uh, Karen McMullins uh, asks, in 1914 AOH convention, the head of the Hibernians rifles promised 5,000 rifles to Roger Casement. Do you know why this commitment wasn't fulfilled? Yeah. I think that was, was that in Norfolk, Virginia? It, I, I, there was certainly a, 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 con- a convention in July, July 1914 in Norfolk. I don't know if it was state or, or higher than that. And Roger Casement was present. And he then had been to see McGarity in Philadelphia and then went back to see McGarity in Philadelphia. And thousands and thousands of pounds and thousands of dollars and, and a huge quantity of gold, very transferable in the, in the, in the underworld, was given to Casement, right? Because they'd heard that the, uh, the, Holt guns, the Holt gun running had been successful, which proved that they're in business. And it also that the, the King's Own Scottish borders had shot and bayoneted um, about 10 or 12 civilians in, in, in close to the O'Connell Street Bridge area on Baxter's Walk, for those of you who know Dublin City. I think four, three or four of them died from it, but, but many more than that were shot and bayoneted, including women, which is, which is pretty heavy going, even by the standards of, of 1914. Um, the war circumstances, you, it, would, it became much more difficult to put large consignments of weaponry uh, uh, out of the port of, you know, Brooklyn or, or Yonkers or whatever, and have that arrive in Cork. But small batches of weaponry did go. Um, I think the, the, better, the better move in the short term was to provide money so that European arms buyers and indeed UK arms buyers could be approached to acquire medium and modest size, size resources of arms and munitions. And that's what did happen. Now, I repeat, weaponry was sent uh, ingeniously to places like Liverpool and Glasgow, where there's strong IRA presence, and retranshipped uh, across the Irish Sea into Belfast, into Derry, all the eastern seaboard, the Irish Sea ports received weaponry that was paid for by America, purchased in the UK, and came across. There's also direct shipments, for instance, that one I can tell you straight about from the United States of, of very high grade, top grade, expensive shotguns that were given a spurious address of a loyalist gun dealer in Derry City. Uh, but the IRA who worked in the post office or were meant to deliver them knew that they weren't going there. Uh, so 
licensed gun dealers were being approached to with, with fake documentation that looked like they're importing gear that they never got and never paid for. It was paid for. It was paid for places like um, like uh, um, Hibernian sources and those who wanted to put the money where the mouth is in terms of the war material. It didn't make sense for small groups of people to go out and buy 25 rifles and put them in the post. But there are ways you could do that if you're in contact with Clan Gale or the IRB. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to John Callahan. John, please unmute and the floor is yours. Should be bottom left. Uh, it, bottom left should be a button for mute, unmute. Did we lose up? Uh, Tim, Ron? did you? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Tim. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that was uh, the questions. Um, actually, I believe that the uh, the, um, the the Hibernian uh, Convention, National Convention, was in Chicago that year at the auditorium. So that that matters. Uh, but I, uh, that's uh, and again in the following, I don't know if uh, Ron could still hear us in this regard, but uh, in the same sense of there was a question of why didn't um, and I think we kind of covered this. Why did the uprising in 1960 not take off like I hope it would? I think we kind of covered a lot of that. Uh, so if you want to say a couple words to that, and then that's pretty Thank much you, what Tim. we have from you, Tim. Well, in brief, because I know I know there's other people need to get in, and you probably want to move towards wrapping things up, but the Hibernians did have versions of the Hibernian rifles in many, many states. And indeed, the clan had the Irish volunteers in many states. And an Irish-American man named Michael Lonergan whose family moved to New York, uh, he would be, he'd been the chiefs, uh, one of the chief uh, prime movers in Athena Aaron, the youth wing of the Republican movement, which came under the, the real authority of the Irish IRB. The more famous one would be Billy Con, Con Colbert, who was shot dead, um, Houston, who was shot dead, and then uh, Eamon Martin, who thankfully wasn't. But the man who introduced the Irish in Athena Aaron uniform was um, young Michael Larnigan, and it was based on American battle dress, and that's due to his transatlantic conditions, okay? Then he moved to America, and he founded the New York Nathena Aaron, which were affiliated to the Irish ones. Similarly, uh, two units you know, of the ladies AOH were used by Sidney Gifford to project them coming them on. So the women's auxiliary were also present in New York City, utilizing pre-existing American structures. You see this out in, I've seen it in, in Anaconda and Montana, where the close interface of the Clan de Gale organization, calling themselves the Robert Emmett Little Association, because they often had different names, they had their own rifles. Uh, and the huge cross fertilization membership between the AOH and the, and the clan in the mining camps and those Western Montana towns and Western states in general. So there were lots of Irish American militias, all of whom were dedicated to achieving the Irish Republic one way or another. Now, they weren't going to be directly taking part, although actually some of them actually did. And the OC, the imposed OC, the Maynooth Volunteers was actually a man who had been an engineer, he'd been in South Africa, he'd been in, in, the Ameri he'd been in Colorado and Idaho. Um, he was the he came back and he was an explosive engineer. Many of those people would have had a lot more to do if Don McNeil, the commander chief, hadn't told them not to do it on on, on Good Friday in, in April 1960. As we it's a huge to, story there. Yeah. As we move to Sean Pender, if you look at his screensaver, anyone who could tell us in chat where each of those murals are, what they are, and where they are, the first one to tell us in chat, we got a little uh, a little parting gift for you that we'll send out to you, Sean. I just got to make sure I don't move my big head so people can see them there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Danny. Great job as well. And, and to Dan Taylor setting this up. I've got the uh, great honor to be able to call Ruan a, a friend. Uh, I've met him in many states. Uh, we were visited together to Virginia and Montana uh, state conventions. And I had the unique pleasure of uh, seeing Ruan hold uh, an overflow building uh, room in Notre Dame at the Hibernian Lecture in, in, you know, waiting on every word. And I just commend him for all the great works. Ruan has a lot of works out there that are published. If you go on to, I'm sure, any of the uh, books, online bookstores, it's a great way to do it. So thank you, my friend, for, uh, again, teaching about our past. Um, I, could, I could continue to listen to you for hours. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Gary Cole, you're muted. Liam, you're next. This was a, a great afternoon. I mean, the, the knowledge that you have that you share with everybody is un unbelievable. 
And uh, I just wish you uh, uh, much success in what you're doing and opening up these uh, words uh, that give so much meaning to the AOH and to everybody that's on this call. But thank you very much for all you do and keep up the great, great work you're doing. Thanks, Jerry. I appreciate that. Liam. Thank you, Danny. What a terrific event. And, uh, and Dan Taylor as well. Ruan, good to see you again. What a great event. And uh, we owe you tuition payments because this was a, a <laughs> wonderful lecture. I think, uh, and, and thank you for sharing so much in such a, such a short amount of time because this history is important because we were the voice of Irish America as, as Hibernians, of course. And our impact on uh, Ireland, as, as you've outlined in such a short amount of time, is important for us to know as we look back just over 100 years because that's who we were then and that's who we are now. And uh, um, we continue to support Ireland and, and these efforts. And so I wrote down a lot of names I hadn't heard before that you mentioned. Um, it's terrific. So thank you so much for your partnership and being with us today. And uh, we look forward to more work ahead. God bless. Absolutely. Thank you. Neil. Uh, again, Ron, I just want to thank you. It, uh, to echo everybody else, it's always a pleasure to hear you speak. We'd like to hear you speak more often. And I'm hoping another book is on its way. I'm too coming. <laughs> Okay, which two, which two, Ron? Just give give it a plug. Well, they're they're not they won't be out for a year or two. One is okay. on the nineteen fifties campaign, and the other is a third volume about IRA prisoners in England in the Long War. Well, we'll, we'll get a link to... up uh, when those come out. We'll make sure we get a link Cheers. up and we'll promote them. Um, we're going to go to Dan Taylor, and then uh, just a, a quick thirty seconds from Leo and Jim, and uh, let Ruan end the uh, end the day. Go ahead, Dan. What a great job you did today. Just, just want to thank Ruan for all, for all of his knowledge and wisdom that he imparted to us today and to everyone who participated. And as you say, Danny, this is uh, just part of a series. We'll be back next Saturday at 1 p.m. Uh, so hopefully people will tune in then. And with that, we'll turn it over to next week's guests. Leo and everyone, I got to tell you, I, I, I met these guys when they asked us for a little bit of help. And um, we ended up meeting them. And in Galway, each of them separately, and they were two of the most generous people I've ever met. And we're really excited for next week. But Leo, closing words uh, and closing plugs for next week's event. Thank you, Daddy. And again, I'd just like to add by a few words to those of my esteemed colleague, Jim, and to say that our presentation next week will be somewhat different to Rwanda's, which was so wide ranging, so detailed and so informative. Ours will be less political, shall I say, and more personal. Now, there will be an element of politics in it as well. There will be dovetailing between Rwanda's story and ours to a degree. Even some of the characters will overlap because John Devoy features briefly in ours, Emma de Valera features uh, briefly in ours too, but it's mainly a personal story. I'm sitting here in Williamstown within three miles of the house where Michael McGovern was born. And only for a series of coincidences, his memory would have been lost forever. From one line of memory, we have mushroomed that into 300 pages, and we have no doubt that you will find his story next week extremely fascinating as we unfold the story of a remarkable man. Thank you, Leo. Jim? And I'll tell you before Jim gets on, Jerry Cole owes him lunch because he left his credit card somewhere. And Jim, you're muted. And uh, Jim drove six hours to get Jerry's uh, credit card back to us. Go ahead, Jim. Closing words. Well, well the coincidence was uh, Jerry um, uh, and and you were at Kirkpatrick, uh, having uh, climbed Kirkpatrick and. Uh, our uh, presentation next week is on the eve of uh, St. Patrick's Day, and it will involve quite um, an engagement with the story of St. Patrick, because uh, Michael McGovern never allowed a St. Patrick's Day to pass without writing a, a special poem, which was published in The Vindicator of the Telegram. Not only that, but he became enraged about 1904 when a series of um, mocking postcards, mocking the AOH in particular, uh, appeared um, on the um, bookstands and in the newsagents in, in Youngstown. And he launched a blistering counterattack on um, the mockery uh, of St. Patrick. So there's um, hopefully next week we will we will uh, engage uh, AOH members with the story of Michael McGovern, 
uh, we will be able to share some of the magnificent poetry he wrote. He is um, only one of two Labour poets ever uh, to have been produced uh, by Ireland. Uh, Tim uh, Connell, who uh, wrote the famous Red uh, Flag, is the other one. But his story runs through uh, that 100 years of Irish history, but it's also a very personal story. He reveals a great deal of his, his, his own personality, he was also uh, quite a significant lyric poet. Uh, he had a lot to say about the war and the Spanish-American War. Um, and there's a great poignancy. And he, again, is just one of these undiscovered minor characters who, um, uh, it was said of John Devoy, he, he needs uh, he needs a, a more detailed biography. This is the first attempt to present uh, Michael McGovern the Irish emigrants who became known as the Puddler Poet uh, to a wider audience. And we are absolutely delighted that we are able to reach him through, um, through your webinar because the AOH was central uh, to Michael McGovern's life. He, he mentioned it in much of his writings. And I, I, we just want to bring you a flavor of the story and of the beautiful poetry that this man produced. A man, if I can just mention to end, who uh, was it? He, he had six weeks education, he tells us, in a hedge school. And that's a whole other story. But he went on to become a classical scholar. He, he wrote some really, really powerful poetry uh, and, and was such a, a voice for working men in America at a particular time, but he never forgot Ireland. He wrote short stories and he wrote uh, very trenchant articles uh, specifically about the period uh, of the, the treaty negotiations when he was able to reach back into his rattle bag of history and talk about uh, massacres at Candeboy, um, um, you know, places where, uh, you know, very few Irish History students would even remember what went on at, at Clandy Boy. They would remember Limerick and Kinsale. But McGovern had an encyclopedic knowledge of the minor events which shaped Irish history. And we just want to share some of those with, uh, with you. Thank you, Jim. And, and congratulations to Rita O'Hara. She uh, was the first one to uh, correctly identify both of uh, Sean's murals separated by his uh, noggin there. We appreciate John for dividing them up. So we're going to get something out to her tomorrow night. Uh, we have an event that the LAOH is putting on with the granddaughter of Thomas uh, McDonough. So we hope to see everyone there. You all received a link uh, from us. Um, and uh, you can find that I'm sure on the ladies uh, national webpage as well. Uh, and just to clarify, Jim, I climbed Crow Patrick and Jerry spent the day in that bar where you picked up his credit card and that might be related to why his credit card was still there when we got to uh, meet you at lunch three hours later. And Ron, what a wonderful, wonderful time. Great work from Neil and, and Dan Taylor. Couldn't have done it without you too. We're gonna give you uh, closing comments. And then as we end, we're gonna hear Foggy Do from uh, the great event for the 1916 commemoration that took place in Pearl River, New York. Ruin, it's yours to end. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for hosting me. It's, it's always great uh, dealing with Hibernians in the US and their, their friends. So I should say that um, I'll do it again if, you, if, you, if you'll have me back. And uh, best wishes to all my friends in the US. Thank you. God bless. And we'll uh, see everyone next week. Thank you for your time. Past me by 
When you fell in the foggy 